I want to introduce tonight's speaker, Mike Weber. Mike is a popular returning speaker for the museum, and he has a long history and love of Cornwall. As a child, he collected rock and mineral specimens from in and around the waste rock piles, and this led him to a study of geology. Uh, as a 1982 geoscience graduate from Penn State, Mike worked for 36 years as a geologist, health physicist, and manager for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the U.S. Geological Survey. After retiring from federal service, he returned to Cornwall Furnace, where he serves as a guide and researches the history of mining and the geology at Cornwall and similar deposits in Pennsylvania. One of Mike's ongoing research projects is studying the records of the Cornwall Division of Bethlehem Steel, which he is turning into a book called Always More Production, The History of Mining Iron in the Mine at Cornwall, Pennsylvania from 1737 until 1973. Please welcome our speaker, Mike Weber. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, I'm glad especially that you're joining us this evening because I know some of you might be suffering from a little bit of Zoom fatigue as we begin the second year of uh, our stay-at-home experience uh, during this ongoing pandemic. I especially appreciate your interest in the topic on this webinar on civilian nuclear emergencies. It's my pleasure to present this topic to you tonight. I want to thank the friends of Cornwall Iron Furnace for sponsoring this webinar, particularly our host, Mike Emery, the site administrator of Cornwall, as well as Kathy Donaldson, secretary of the Friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace. Now, during the last two webinars in which I spoke last year, I presented on the history of mining at Cornwall and the prehistory or geology of Cornwall. Tonight's topic is considerably different and much more contemporary. Before I returned to Cornwall, as Mike mentioned, uh, I worked for 36 years for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. At the NRC, I helped to lead the NRC responses to a wide variety of nuclear emergencies, including the last one that I'll describe in my presentation tonight. And as a senior manager at the NRC, I helped to instruct NRC employees about the important lessons that we learned from each of these emergencies. I retired from NRC in 2018, so the views that I express this evening are mine and do not necessarily represent the official views of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Now, at the beginning of this webinar, you might be scratching your head asking, why should you be interested in this topic? Well, if you live around Cornwall, as you will soon see, some of you actually participated in helping to make this history. One of these emergencies occurred just west of Cornwall at Middletown, Pennsylvania, the site of Three Mile Island. After a brief refresher about nuclear power, I plan to review the three civilian nuclear emergencies that I focused on, including what happened, what were the consequences, and what do we learn about nuclear safety from each of them? Before I conclude, I'll summarize the role of nuclear power today in Pennsylvania. And I'll leave plenty of time at the end of my presentation to answer your questions and listen to your comments. Now, I do recognize that this topic can be quite controversial. My intent is to present a historical perspective about these nuclear emergencies. I am not advocating for or against nuclear power. To understand these emergencies, it'll be helpful for our audience to have some familiarity with the basic concepts of how nuclear power plants work. Some of you may find this presentation overly simplified, while others may find it complex. My objective is to ensure that everyone in the audience has a basic understanding of nuclear power generation. I point out at the beginning, of course, that there are a wide variety of types and designs of nuclear power plants. The diagram on the slide that you're currently viewing is a simplified view of one type of nuclear power plant, the pressurized water reactor. And it represents about two thirds of the nuclear power plants that operate in the United States today. 
The basic concept of this nuclear power plant is to use a nuclear chain reaction to generate heat, to boil water, to produce steam, to generate electricity. The nuclear reaction occurs in the nuclear fuel, and that nuclear fuel is located inside a large steel vessel that is designed to contain the pressure and hot water that's generated by the nuclear reaction. The reactor vessel and many other components of the nuclear reactor are housed within a containment building, a large concrete and steel building that is intended to contain large releases of radioactive material from the nuclear reactor in case there's an emergency. Hot water flows out of the reactor vessel and into a steam generator where it produces steam. The hot water is then returned to the reactor while the steam is piped out to spin turbines and an electrical generator to produce electricity to power the electrical grid and modern society. Steam exiting from the turbines is then cooled down before it is pumped back to the steam generators. This cooling process releases water vapor from the cooling towers. Many people think that the water vapor released from these cooling towers is radioactive. But as you see in the diagram, the river water is being used to cool the steam. So those billowing clouds that you might see from the cooling towers are really no more radioactive than the river water itself. The rate of the nuclear reaction is controlled in this reactor by inserting control rods from the top to slow down the reaction. As you can see in the diagram, a lot of that blue there is water and water is an essential ingredient in this kind of a nuclear power plant, not only to produce steam to spin the turbines and cool down the water that's fed into the steam generators, but also to help cool the nuclear fuel and facilitate the nuclear reaction. So let's just briefly review all that again. So this is the location of the nuclear fuel. I'm moving the cursor around where the nuclear fuel is located, and that's inside the reactor pressure vessel. Control rods are inserted and withdrawn from the top of the reactor to control the, the rate of the reaction. Hot water generated from that reaction flows out into the steam generator through these coils and then is pumped back into the reactor vessel. The steam that's generated in the steam generator then flows out this pipe through the turbines the turbines spin, including the electrical generator producing electricity, and that goes out on the grid. Meanwhile, the steam exits the turbines, enters the condenser where it's cooled, and the steam is condensed back into liquid water, and that liquid water is piped back into the steam generator. And then the last water loop is pumping the water out of the river into the condenser where it cools the steam, never contacting the steam, and then that hot water released from the condenser is discharged into the cooling tower where it falls down and enters the cycle again. So there's three loops of water. One right here, it's called the primary loop. There's a loop here between the steam generator, the turbines and the condenser. And then that third loop is the water here that cools the steam entering the condenser uh, over and over again. Well, congratulations if you got all that. You've now completed Nuclear Power 101. It might help to compare the containment building of a nuclear power plant with the U.S. Capitol Dome to understand the relative size of nuclear power plants. Both are illustrated on this slide using the same scale. And as you can see, the containment building of a reactor is a bit wider and shorter than the Capitol Dome. In addition, I would be remiss if I did not provide you a peek inside a cooling tower. In this photo, we're looking up toward the sky from the base of the tower. And as you can see, the cooling tower is really a hollow concrete structure. Although hyperbolic cooling towers like this one are often associated with nuclear power plants, after all, that's the symbol of Fremont Island, they are used to cool water and transfer heat for a wide variety of facilities, including nuclear power plants and other electrical generating stations. With this orientation in mind, let's move on to the three civilian nuclear emergencies. These photos might help you remember where you were in life 
when the three nuclear emergencies occurred in March 1979, April 1986, and March 2011. Many of you likely remember these emergencies, especially the first one, and some of you can probably recall where you were and what you were doing when you first heard about these emergencies. So let's begin with the first civilian nuclear emergency we'll discuss in our webinar this evening, the meltdown at Three Mile Island Unit 2. In about three weeks, we will commemorate the 42nd anniversary of the accident at Three Mile Island, or TMI. The accident began on March 28th, 1979. The photo on the right side of the slide is from the program that was produced and aired on the local public television station WITF in 2019 to mark the 40th anniversary of the accident. Of the three emergencies, the accident at TMI was the closest to Cornwall, occurring only 30 miles to the west. Some of you may have been affected by this emergency and some may have actually assisted in preparing for or responding to the emergency. The accident occurred in the second nuclear reactor at Three Mile Island, which was licensed to operate in February of 1978 and only began operating about six months before the accident occurred. Team MI Unit 1, the other nuclear power plant there at TMI, began operating four years earlier in September of 1974. Another connection with Cornwall, by the way, is that the power at Cornwall Mines was decreased for several days in December of 1970 to allow the installation of a new 230,000 volt power line to support the nuclear power plant at Three Mile Island. Now, Three Mile Island Nuclear Power Station is located on the island by the same name in the Susquehanna River, about three miles south of Middletown, Pennsylvania. The accident began in the early morning hours when a series of equipment malfunctions and operator actions resulted in the loss of water from the reactor vessel. The water level dropped in the vessel and that exposed the nuclear fuel and it rapidly heated up and melted damaging about half of the nuclear core. By this point in the accident already on the first day, the emergency had in, earned a distinction as the worst civilian nuclear accident in the United States. The plant generally achieved its purpose in protecting workers and the surrounding public by containing immense amounts of radioactive material in the reactor core and only allowing a tiny fraction to escape into the environment. However, Confusion ensued during the next several days and fueled government distrust and public outrage. By the third day of the accident, Saturday, March 30, Governor Richard Thornburg recommended evacuation of pregnant women as well as preschool aged children within five miles of the plant. The governor also recommended sheltering in place for the remainder of the residents who stayed in the area. In total, about 144,000 people evacuated from the area surrounding the nuclear power plant. We can use this diagram of Three Mile Island to explain more specifically what went wrong at the beginning of the emergency. The diagram is a little more complex than the earlier diagram we discussed on when we were talking about nuclear power 101. One of the pilot operated relief valves or pores as they're called, located in this red circle right about there, stuck open during the accident and allowed water from the reactor to escape into the containment building. Reactor operators who had not been trained to respond to this kind of an accident stopped adding water to the reactor and that caused water levels in the reactor vessel to drop. Their understanding of the accident and their response were also hampered by malfunctioning gauges and sensors, as well as too many warning bells and flashing lights in the small cramped reactor control room. By the end of the first day of the accident, operators restored cooling by injecting water into the reactor vessel and that cooled the fuel and restored the safety of the reactor. Nearly three years after the accident, reactor operators peered into the core for the first time and saw through grainy images that nuclear fuel in the reactor had indeed melted. 
This diagram was prepared in 1985 based on information collected during the forensic investigation of the accident. The information confirmed that a nuclear meltdown had indeed occurred in the reactor vessel. And as you see in the diagram, nuclear fuel and instruments that were located here in the upper part of the core, the nuclear core, melted and that molten fuel and other metals flowed down here to the base of the reactor vessel. And as I said before, by injecting cool water back into the reactor core, the operator solidified that molten fuel at the base of the vessel and throughout the core. Now, at the time of the accident, the core of the reactor contained large amounts of radioactive material. There are many different types of radioactive material in the core of an operating nuclear power reactor. Radioactive iodine-131 is one of the most important to contain in order to protect workers and members down, of the public downwind from the plant. When the accident occurred, the core contained about 66 million curies of iodine-131. Now, 66 million cure, uh, of anything sounds like a big number, and it is. In addition, the unit curie is itself a rather large unit. To place the size of a curie in some perspective, we generally measure the amounts of radioactive material in the environment using the unit picocuries. A picocurie is one trillionth of a curie, or a one preceded by 11 zeros on the right side of the decimal point. Despite the large amount of iodine-131 in the nuclear core at the time of the accident, only an estimated 15 curies were released to the environment during and after the accident. Maximum radiation doses to members of the public were small compared with the public dose limit. Aside from the technical aspects of the nuclear emergency, reporting on the accident fueled public confusion and mistrust of the utility and government. The movie, The China Syndrome, was released less than two weeks before the accident at TMI began. And in that movie, a real incident that had occurred at the Dresden nuclear power plant in 1970 was depicted at the hypothetical plant and raised public concerns about the potential of a nuclear reactor core melting through the reactor vessel and down through the earth on its way to China. Two weeks after the movie's release, the public heard conflicting and garbled messages about the seriousness of the accident at TMI and whether protective measures like evacuation were necessary to protect the public. Public reaction was immediate and overwhelming, landing the accident on the covers of Time, Newsweek, and Life magazines, fueling long and contentious press conferences, and prompting poorly coordinated response actions at the state, local, and federal levels uh, involving private citizens. You too may have personally experienced this confusion, frustration, anger, and fear. So what did the accident at Three Mile Island Unit 2 teach us? The lessons were broad and deep at the local, state, federal, and international levels. The nuclear industry made numerous enhancements that improved nuclear safety, including advances to reactor design, operations, and training, recognition of the importance of smaller releases to nuclear safety, and strengthening emergency planning and preparedness. As a result of the accident, the nuclear industry established the Institute for Nuclear Power Operations, otherwise known as INPO, to strengthen the training and qualifications of reactor operators and to enhance the safety and operational performance of nuclear power plants. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the regulator of the nuclear industry, enhanced the rigor of reactor operator licensing, strengthened oversight of nuclear power plants, and improved the agency's organization and emergency response capabilities. One of the most profound impacts of the accident at Three Mile Island was that it confirmed that nuclear accidents, including core melts, could occur. Before the accident at Three Mile Island, many people in the nuclear industry, and indeed even at the NRC, thought that a nuclear meltdown was simply impossible because there were so many redundant safety systems built into the plants. The accident at TMI was a huge wake-up call, not just for the United States, 
but also for counterparts around the globe. When I arrived at the NRC in 1982, only three years after the accident, this confirmation was fresh, and I observed firsthand the improvements in nuclear safety prompted by the recognition. Only seven years later, the alarm bells rang again thousands of miles away in the town of Pripyat, Ukraine in April, 1986. Unlike the accident at TMI, where the public knew about the accident the same day that it occurred, Soviet authorities deferred for weeks announcements about the accident at Chernobyl. And as the facts eked out of the Soviet Union about the causes and significance of the accident, the Soviet propaganda machine kicked into overdrive to obscure and obfuscate the truth. You see here a photo of the first enclosure or sarcophagus that was constructed over and around the damaged reactor after the accident. It has subsequently been replaced with a more durable and effective enclosure. The Chernobyl nuclear emergency began on April 26, 1986 and primarily impacted Chernobyl Unit 4. Early in the morning, the operators at the plant turned off certain safety features to conduct a test that was intended to demonstrate to the world the safety of Soviet reactors. The emergency did just the opposite. Conditions in the nuclear reactor quickly deteriorated and caused a large steam explosion that ruptured the nuclear core and blew a hole in the roof of the reactor building, as you see in this photo. Unlike United States reactors, the reactors at Chernobyl did not have robust containment buildings, and the nuclear cores contained large amounts of graphite, a relatively pure form of carbon. At Cornwall Furnace, carbon in the form of charcoal fueled the smelting process. And just like the charcoal at Cornwall, the graphite at Chernobyl caught on fire and burned for days. The fire spewed large amounts of radioactive material into the environment, including chunks of highly radioactive nuclear fuel. After monitoring stations in Scandinavia detected the telltale signs of a nuclear power plant accident, Soviet authorities denied that a nuclear accident had occurred. Tens of nuclear operators and firemen who responded to the emergency, the so-called liquidators, were killed promptly by large amounts of radiation exposure they received during the accident. Hundreds of thousands of people were eventually evacuated from the exclusion zone, some permanently. After the fire was extinguished and the release of radioactive material substantially reduced, photographs of the plant revealed just how extensive the damage was, both to the reactor and to the adjacent turbine building. During the accident in Chernobyl, nuclear fuel melted and flowed through pipes in and beneath the reactor building, as you see in the photos on the right. Although the fuel in the photos is no longer molten or melted, it is highly radioactive and remains in the same condition at Chernobyl today. The United States, the Soviet Union, and other nuclear nations studied what went wrong during the accident at Chernobyl for about a decade following the emergency. Here in the US, as I mentioned before, the design and operational deficiencies that contributed to the accident had only limited applicability. However, the United States extensively worked with the Soviet Union, the Soviet republics, and other countries, including and the International Atomic Energy Agency, in significantly enhancing emergency preparedness and nuclear safety. The global community safely closed down reactors of similar design around the world. The International Convention on Nuclear Safety and international peer review missions grew out of this cooperation and have since enhanced global nuclear safety. The accident also heightened the recognition of the importance of safety culture in an organization. In other words, how people make decisions with respect to safety when no one is watching, that's safety culture. The nuclear industry and government agencies in the United States have continued to enhance nuclear safety culture during the last 30 years. The third nuclear emergency that I'll discuss this evening occurred on March 11, 2011, thousands of miles away in Fukushima, Japan. On Thursday of this week, day after tomorrow, 
we recognize the 10th anniversary of this accident. I knew as I arose for work early on that morning 10 years ago that I was in for an exciting day at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Overnight, I had received several messages about a strong earthquake and large aftershocks, as well as tsunami warnings. My first priority when I got to work that morning was to ensure the safety of nuclear power plants and other radioactive material here in the United States. And once that was ensured, my attention turned to the condition of the plants in Japan and the protection of Americans, Japanese, and other citizens nearby the plants. When I returned home 19 hours later, the world was immersed in yet another nuclear emergency 25 years after the accident at Chernobyl. This photo on the slide shows the four damaged nuclear power plants at Fukushima Daiichi, with unit four on the left and unit one on the right. Three of the four uh, were damaged by hydrogen explosions. And by the time the photo was taken, three of the nuclear reactor cores had melted down inside the plants. <clears throat> Excuse me. The accident began when a large earthquake off the east coast of Japan damaged the plants at Fukushima Daiichi and other nuclear power stations in Japan. The large tremors knocked down power lines and disrupted uh, power supplies to the plants. Soon thereafter, large tsunamis inundated the plants and destroyed other safety systems. You can see one of the tsunami waves washing around the outside of the reactor buildings in this photo. Operators at the plants had been warned before the accident that much larger tsunamis could occur and exceed the defenses at the plants. The company operating the plants at the time, Tokyo Electric Power Company or TEPCO, had been reviewing these warnings when the accident occurred. The tsunamis magnified the impacts of the earthquake itself and eliminated or substantially weakened plant electrical systems that were intended to cool the reactor cores and monitor the condition of the plants. And without core cooling, as we saw in our Nuclear Power 101 slide, the nuclear fuel in the reactor cores in units one, two, and three melted within the first few days of the accident. The fuel in Unit 4 did not melt because it had already been removed from the reactor vessel for routine maintenance shortly before the accident. As a result of the fuel melting in the three nuclear cores, the plant released large amounts of radioactive material to the environment during the accident. Early indications of these releases came from U.S. government agencies located in Japan. The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission responded to the accident for the next nine months along with other agencies of the federal government. And in addition to working cooperatively with our close ally, Japan, in combating the accident and its impacts, we were also ensuring the protection of the nearly 300,000 American citizens who live and work in Japan. NRC employees arrived in Japan to assist in the response less than two days after the accident began. The earthquake that occurred in the early afternoon of March 11th in Japan at a magnitude of nine caused the largest Japanese island of Honshu to slide east by about eight feet and moved the Earth's axis by about eight inches. It caused several large tsunamis. At Fukushima Daiichi, the tallest tsunami wave was about 47 feet tall. The earthquake and tsunamis killed more than 16,000 people, many of whom were swept out to sea and never found. As a result of the large releases of radioactive material from the plants, the Japanese authorities evacuated about 165,000 people, and almost 4,000 of those people died during the evacuations from prompt causes such as heart attacks, as well as chronic causes, including depression and suicide. Although Japan has been making progress in reducing the amount of contaminated land around the plants, the remaining evacuated zone is slightly less than twice the size of the District of Columbia. The accident destroyed four operating nuclear power plants at Fukushima Daiichi and resulted in the shutdown of the remaining nuclear power plants in Japan. As of late last year, only nine of the 39 nuclear power reactors in Japan have resumed operations. 
The Japanese government estimates that it will require more than 40 years and $200 billion to decontaminate and decommission the reactors at Fukushima Daiichi alone. In addition, with each passing day, site operators collect more contaminated water from beneath and around the site, which currently totals more than a million gallons that are stored in over a thousand tanks. And you see some of those tanks in this photo, which are uh, colored blue, white, and gray. <clears throat> now, as in the previous emergencies we discussed, the U.S. promptly and thoroughly evaluated the emergency at Fukushima Daiichi and concluded in 2011 that similar accidents were unlikely here in the United States. The conclusion was based on existing measures at the U.S. plants that reduced the likelihood of core damage and large-scale radioactive releases. The task force who conducted the review for the U.S. also concluded that continued operation of nuclear power plants in the United States was safe. The photo on this slide shows the task force briefing the members of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in a public meeting in 2011. Notwithstanding those broad conclusions, the task force recommended a series of actions be taken to enhance safety in the United States. Some of the actions were taken voluntarily by the nuclear industry, and others were imposed on the industry by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. These included conducting thorough reevaluations of earthquake and flooding hazards at the plants, verification of the effectiveness of existing safety measures, enhancements and capabilities to cope with the loss of emergency power, improved venting of nuclear power plants during severe accidents, enhanced monitoring of the pools that are used to store and cool spent nuclear fuel, and conducting enhanced inspections by the NRC. The nuclear industry also built and today operates two safer centers in Tennessee and Arizona that supply additional equipment to nuclear power plants in the United States on an as-needed basis in the event of an emergency. Now that we've discussed these accidents, it can be helpful to compare the emergencies to gain perspective about their relative significance. The three emergencies are portrayed on this slide with Three Mile Island on the top, Chernobyl in the lower left-hand corner, and Fukushima in the lower right. The orange circles around the plants depict the initial areas that were evacuated, eight kilometers or five miles for Three Mile Island, 30 kilometers for Chernobyl, and about 20 kilometers for Fukushima. There were no immediate deaths associated with TMI, 30 deaths with Chernobyl, and there were three fatalities associated with Fukushima, although these deaths were really more associated with the tsunamis than with the nuclear accident. On the left side of the chart, note the comparison of the amounts of radioactive material that were released during each of the accidents. These amounts are reported using the international unit Peta becquerels, or 10 to the 15th becquerels. That's 5,200 for Chernobyl, 770 for Fukushima, and 0 0.062 for Three Mile Island. The lengths of the blue and tan bars are proportional to these amounts. The amount of radioactive material released from TMI is depicted by that thin black line that you can probably barely see on top of the stacked bars. In summary, both Chernobyl and Fukushima Daiichi released large amounts of radioactive material into the environment and were far more serious than the accident at Three Mile Island Unit 2, which was itself a significant nuclear accident. As I mentioned at the outset, I'll conclude my presentation tonight by briefly discussing nuclear power in Pennsylvania. The state has four operating nuclear power plants with a total of eight nuclear power reactors located at Peach Bottom, Susquehanna, Limerick, and Beaver Valley. These plants produce about 39% of the electricity generated in the state, and that accounts for over 90% of Pennsylvania's so-called carbon-free electricity. As many of you may be aware, Unit 1, the sister plant to Three Mile Island Unit 2, permanently shut down in September of 2019. And both of the TMI plants are expected to be decommissioned by 2080, following a period of safe storage. Last December, operators at TMI conducted the final siren drill on December 3rd and transferred the license for the Unit 2 plant from First Energy to TMI Solutions for safe storage 
and eventual decommissioning. I want to thank you for your attention and interest in this topic of civilian nuclear emergencies. I also want to thank the Friends of Cornwall Furnace and especially Mike Emery and Kathy Donaldson for hosting this webinar. Now I'd be happy to answer your questions and listen to your comments. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for, for your talk, Mike. We do have uh, some questions that have come through uh, with the, uh, the Q&A button. Uh, this, uh, uh, actually all of them at the moment are from Michael Blauk. Uh, who, who I know here. And uh, so we'll, we'll start at the top. What was the estimated amount of radiation contained in the TMI Unit 2 reactor immediately after the event? Hmm. Well, that's difficult to answer <laughs> uh, simply because the radiation detectors that were installed inside the containment were not uh, properly sized for the levels of radiation that they actually experienced during the emergency. I, uh, I'm not in this to advertise for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but if you're interested in that sort of thing, I would call your attention to uh, this document, which you might be able to see. Yes. Uh, you can find it on the NRC's website. It's called the Three Mile Island Accident of 1979 Knowledge Management Digest. And it comes in two volumes. Uh, one is an overview and one is specifically focused on recovery and cleanup. And uh, in that set of documents, there are a series of uh, DVDs and on those DVDs are, are thousands of documents including the forensic analysis that was conducted after the accident, as well as a multi-agency radiological assessment uh, that was conducted uh, after the accident. And so I think if you're going to find that information, to the best of our knowledge, you can find that information in those uh, references. Okay, Mike, uh, I'll, I'll give you another one here. How long does it take to get government approval and licensing for a new nuclear power plant in the United States? <laughs> a long time. <laughs> uh, again, I'm not with the NRC any longer, so uh, I'm just speaking as a member of the public. Understood. Uh, I do know that the NRC received a series of uh, new license applications for nuclear power plants uh, in the 2007 timeframe, 2008. And uh, none of those new plants are fully licensed to operate as of 2021. Uh, and those license applications were submitted with our uh, new and improved, uh, or I should say NRC's new and improved licensing process. And so that allowed uh, applicants to uh, submit a standard design uh, and also get early approval of sites uh, before they submitted their combined operating license application. So those uh, improvements, those different applications were really designed to improve upon the first round of licensing experience that we had here in the United States uh, by eliminating some of the unnecessary confusion and uh, bottlenecks in the licensing process while continuing to afford a full uh, review of the safety and the design of the plants and a uh, full public participation in that licensing process. All right, uh, another question. What is the viability and probability of using SMRs and Gen 3 advanced nuclear reactors for future electrical power or heat generation in the United States? Uh, so technically, SMR, I should point out at the outset, is a small modular reactor. And generation three is uh, the next generation uh, of a design of nuclear power plants 
uh, that uh, follows on the design of many of the plants that are operating in the United States today. So um, technically they are viable technologies. Uh, the question will come down to, in my view, whether people are willing to uh, spend the money uh, and accept the risk, both the, uh, the regulatory risk and the public risk uh, that may be associated with the uh, licensing and operation of those uh, plants. Um, we, some of those reactor license applications that I spoke of are uh, generation three, generation four plants. So technically the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has found that those designs can be uh, constructed and safely operated. So from the technical perspective, I don't have any questions about their viability. Uh, when it comes to probability, the question uh, to me is, you know, will we as a country continue to support the use of nuclear technology and uh, will the companies that are interested in producing, generating electricity, are they willing to put up the capital uh, to invest in the construction and operation long-term of those facilities? All right, uh, next question. Has the United States built any new nuclear plants since TMI? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, in fact. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's an unfortunate misnomer that we stopped building plants in the United States after Three Mile Island. It's true that uh, new applications were canceled uh, subsequent to the accident at Three Mile Island Unit 2, but construction of those plants that were already in the licensing process or had already commenced construction continued. Uh, so throughout my career at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, I uh, had some involvement in the continued licensing of those new nuclear power plants. And then as I mentioned in the answer to the first question, uh, there have been applications for uh, generation three, generation four plants. And um, some of those plants are now well along in their construction. The uh, two new units at the Vogel nuclear site in Georgia are quite advanced in their construction. And I suspect if uh, everything goes according to plan, they may actually commence operations uh, in the 2022-2023 timeframe. All right, another question. Uh, since the title emphasizes civilian emergencies, I'm wondering if there are also military emergencies that have happened and who reacts to those? <clears throat> uh, in fact, there have been military uh, nuclear emergencies. Um, I don't have a, an exhaustive list of all of them and I don't have them ranked in terms of their seriousness, uh, but they range from uh, inadvertent dropping of nuclear weapons or fires that involve nuclear weapons, so-called broken arrow accidents, to uh, more uh, emergencies that per pertain to the nuclear plants that were operated by, the nuclear reactors that were operated by um, uh, the Department of Energy and its predecessor, the Atomic Energy Commission, as well as DOD, uh, Department of Defense operated nuclear facilities. Uh, if there are emergencies that involve uh, those kind of operations, uh, the responsible part of the uh, federal government would either be the Department of Defense or the Department of Energy. <clears throat> but as we've seen, uh, especially in the aftermath of Three Mile Island and other emergencies in this country, uh, nuclear and non-nuclear, uh, it takes a coordinated effort at all levels from local uh, all the way up to the international level uh, organizations to respond for an effective uh, response to uh, emergencies. All right, uh, here's another question. 
what is the status and future of storing spent nuclear fuel uh, for production of electricity as well as from the military? Uh, follow up, is there enough storage capacity and uh, the status of Yucca Mountain? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, and, and you only have one minute to answer. By okay, the way. all right. Well, I will, uh, <laughs> I will try to give you a succinct response. <clears throat> So the nuclear fuel that's been uh, generated in the civilian nuclear power plants uh, since the 1960s has, uh, some of it has been reprocessed. So, uh, but that's a very small amount. Most of that spent nuclear fuel, the irradiated nuclear fuel, is today sitting in storage either in spent nuclear fuel pools at the nuclear plants, so it's in wet storage, or it's been transferred and is today stored in what we call dry casks, uh, which don't rely on water to cool the fuel, but instead uh, allow for uh, air circulation uh, to help cool the fuel and uh, keep it safe. Uh, so uh, for the foreseeable future, this country will continue to rely on uh, storage in spent fuel casks and wet pools. Um, a question there on the, the defense waste. So a lot of the defense waste has been reprocessed to recover the uranium and the plutonium. Uh, some of the uranium and plutonium have been used in fabricating nuclear weapons. Uh, but the residual waste uh, is today primarily stored in uh, high-level waste tanks located at the Savannah River site, at Hanford, and also some at the Idaho uh, Nuclear Engineering Laboratory. Um, and then Yucca Mountain, uh, it's funny you, that came up in the question. Uh, I. Uh, had the opportunity to participate in a Zoom with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission at the Regulatory Information Conference, which is an annual nuclear regulatory conference which is going on this week. And I asked the same question of the new chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, Christopher Hansen, and his response was, well, that's a good question for the Congress to answer. Uh, the Congress, of course, has to fund uh, any work associated with uh, Yucca Mountain. And the last federal appropriation to support uh, any work on Yucca Mountain, which was then primarily to, to close it down, was back in 2010, 2011. Uh, so unless and until the Congress uh, starts appropriating the funds to reactivate the Yucca Mountain project, the project is in a moribund status. Okay, thank you for that. Another question. Uh, I think that was a little longer than a minute. <laughs> no, I, I, was, I was really joking about that because yeah. that was a lot of question that yeah. came around. So uh, another question, is it fair to say that part of U.S. interest in Chernobyl uh, was because uh, of, there was a U.S. designed uh, part of the reactor. Uh, was 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 there something? I, I believe it was a GE plant that said that the, it's part of this. So uh, the question was: Is part of a reason why we were interested is that there were American company design in that reactor? Yeah, I think the question is more appropriate for Fukushima Daiichi. Okay. Uh, I'm not aware of any U.S. component that was in the reactor at Chernobyl. <laughs> okay. uh, I think that was a wholly built Soviet design and uh, constructed and operated. Uh, now, the General Electric Company was the principal designer uh, for the nuclear power plants at Fukushima Daiichi. Uh, those were boiling water reactors, and uh, the General Electric a nuclear company uh, did work with the Japanese in the design and the construction of those facilities and had a continuing presence 
uh, in their, uh, their operation. So I think in part that motivated uh, the strong cooperation participation by the US government, including the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and other agencies, uh, recognizing that we had some responsibility for the technology that was used in those plants. But I would say the more compelling justification for our involvement was the protection of American citizens in Japan as well as the uh, protection of our close ally, Japan. Um, people may not be aware, but after the accident occurred at Three Mile Island, uh, we worked quite closely with the Japanese for uh, decades uh, in the aftermath and the recovery and the cleanup uh, TMI, uh, where they were funding and helping to conduct research to understand what went wrong at Three Mile Island and what technologies were most useful in cleaning up uh, the, the contamination. Uh, so now in the aftermath of Fukushima, we find our roles a little reversed where uh, we're interested uh, here in the United States in obtaining information from our Japanese colleagues, understanding uh, what are they discovering as they go about the stabilization and, and decommissioning of those plants. Uh, and so uh, we're helping them just like they helped us uh, many, many decades ago. Uh, we have another question. Uh, the question is, is, did different nuclear plants use different nuclear fuels? Yes. If they did. Did that have any uh, effect on some of these different outcomes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So the fuel that was used at Three Mile Island was nothing like the fuel that was used in the Chernobyl reactor. Um, now, the, the fuel at TMI was closer to the fuel used in the Fukushima Daiichi plants and yet different. In part, it was different because of the evolution of the fuel technology that occurred between the late 1970s when uh, the TMI-2 plant was loaded with nuclear fuel. And of course, much more recent loading of fuel in the three years or so prior to the accident at Fukushima Daiichi. So enrichment levels go up, the uh, composition of the cladding that's around the nuclear fuel pellets changes through time. Uh, the design, the uh, flow, the energy efficiency, uh, those are all evolutionary changes that are incorporated in the differences in the design of the fuel. Um, and then more recently, especially in the aftermath of the accident of Fukushima Daiichi, there's been growing interest in the use of so-called accident tolerant fuels for reactors in the United States and in other plants of similar design elsewhere in the world. And those fuels uh, nominally would use materials that would be more resistant uh, to potential melting uh, like you had at the TMI plant and you had at the Fukushima Daiichi plants, either in the fuel itself or in the cladding, uh, the metal wrapping, if you will, that surrounds the fuel pellets. All right, just a couple more questions. And uh, this one asked, what would have been the outcome of Fukushima, in your opinion, uh, if emergency generators had been a installed above sea level? Uh, well, they were above sea level. Just not high enough above <laughs> they, they sea level. They just weren't high enough. Uh, in fact, before they built that plant, they, uh, they excavated down so that the plant was closer to the sea level. Uh, and I think that was one of the initial design mistakes that were made, which made the plant more vulnerable to uh, to the tsunamis and uh, to the earthquake. Uh, if they had not uh, lowered the plant and if they had designed the plant to uh, withstand the tsunamis that <clears throat> were uh, predicted later, uh, more recently, uh, the plants may not have had accidents. 
but there's a lot of ifs there. A lot of ifs, yes. Uh, and, you know, you can't unwind time. Uh, the important thing is that you learn from your experiences and you make improvements and, and move forward. All right, this, this one here is uh, another one kind of looking uh, into the looking glass here. Of uh, your thoughts on the practicality of Chernobyl's use as a tourist attraction. I thought I had heard that at some point and uh, uh, the safety related to this type of use. Yeah. Uh, there is nuclear tourism in the area around Chernobyl. Uh, they, uh, the people who conduct this tourism are operating under government uh, regulation and their objective is to ensure that people who come uh, within the vicinity of the plant don't uh, receive more than uh, the publicly al allowable levels of radiation exposure. So yes, it occurs, uh, but no, you can't get into the plant uh, because the residual levels of contamination and radiation are quite high and will remain high uh, for tens to hundreds of years. Yeah, half-life is a long time for this stuff. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the fission products, the iodine-131, cesium-137, cesium-134, cobalt-60, well, they, uh, cobalt-60 is an activation product. Uh, they have much shorter half-lives, but some of the radionuclides that are present in that fuel, uh, will be there for billions of years. <laughs> so unless it's removed at some point and uh, di disposed of uh, safely. Okay, Mike, that uh, brings us in on uh, eight o'clock. I think we've gone through uh, all of uh, the questions. So um, I think that will, will conclude things for the evening. Uh, so let me go ahead and, and make a, a closing statement. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us for this lecture. I especially want to thank Mike Weber for his presentation and for Kathy Donaldson for helping to organize our virtual talk. I also want to thank the Friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace who sponsored this program. If you or your business would like to sponsor a future lecture, please contact the site for further information. And of course, donations are gladly accepted. Uh, please join us for our next lecture on Thursday, April 13th, which will be Historic Markers of Lebanon County by Henry Deamer. We look forward to the day when you can all visit the museum again. In the meantime, please stay safe and good night. <laughs>